I've always been a homebody. I love being at home, wherever home may be. And no place ever felt like home the way that Georgia did. Not just because of the scenery and the connection to the places that I grew up, but also because of the people. Growing up in Marietta, Georgia was really a fabulous place to grow up as a kid. Back then, it was small town USA. Everybody knew everybody. Our road that we lived on was about two and a half miles long. There were only about four houses on the road. It was so desolate. If you were sitting on the front porch and you heard a car coming, that was your guests. It was a very tight-knit community. A lot of people that lived around our area in Marietta were people that my grandfather had grown up with. A lot of the local streets and roads, of course there was a road, Post Oak Trit Road, that was named after my grandfather. There was Sewell Mill Road, which was named after the Sewells, had been there for generations. The Murdochs, Murdoch Road was the road that we lived on growing up. All of those folks were people that had been there for generations. So it was a very tight-knit community. Everybody knew each other. One of my fondest memories as a child was my dad every now and then would take me to one of three local hangouts where all of the, what I referred to as all the old men would sit at the coffee counter and they talked about everything under the sun. They talked about politics, local farming, hot rods, and motorcycles, and tractors, and heavy equipment. And there was even a little bit of gossip. And it was just a great, great place to grow up. Music was always a part of my life. One of the first albums that I ever remember getting was This Is Roger Miller. And of course, the big hit off of that was trailers for sale or rent, rooms to rent 50 cents. I'm a man of means by no means, king of the road. And so people would stop me everywhere that I went. They would ask me, sing that song. And they would give me a little bit of change. And that was the first inkling that I had that, hey, I might be able to turn this into a career at some point. My Uncle Sam Lockhart was probably not only the best musician in our family, but probably one of the best musicians that I knew of anywhere. And he used to take me to bluegrass festivals all over the Southeast. And we had a chance to go to the main stage and listen to all these great bluegrass artists. But then the great music, the really cool music, was the music that was played out in the campground. Because a lot of those artists that would perform on stage, after they were done performing, they would just walk through the campground with their instruments. So it was a very, very cool place to be, especially as an aspiring young musician, because you learned a lot. You learned an awful lot being around those people. For a long time, I sort of put the music on the back burner. When you graduated from high school, you either A, went to college, which wasn't an option for me, or B, you went to work. And in the midst of all that, you got married. So that's exactly what I did. I got married very, very young to my high school sweetheart, and I went out and got a job. Travis was the co-manager here at Dealer Supply. I worked at the main office in Forest Park, and he used to call all his stock orders over the phone to me, and I'd take all the orders from him. I talked to him at least twice a week. We've got an old picture of him when he worked here that we show to people, because some people say, he didn't never work here, and we say, we'll show you, and we show a picture of him, and they think it's pretty cool. My boss was a guy by the name of Richard Lawrence, and he had been a guitar player his whole life as well. As a matter of fact, he had had an opportunity to go out on, on tour with Carlos Santana, and he turned that opportunity down he was very encouraging. He said, you know, he said, I'll go through my entire life wondering whether or not I could have made it. And he said, the last thing in the world that I would want for you or anybody else is to have that feeling of not knowing. 
Richard Lawrence, who was our president of the company, had told him when he was working here that if your dream is to do music, you need to go ahead and just quit dealers and go work there. So that was just the encouragement that I needed. And I remember going into a little restaurant bar club in uh, Marietta. I walked in and there was one guy up on this little stage. He had just him and a guitar and a drum machine. And I sat there and watched him and he was doing everything under the sun. Neil Diamond to John Denver to Merle Haggard. All the stuff that I grew up loving and listening to. As I watched this guy perform, I thought, you know, I could do that. So I introduced myself to him, and then uh, several months later, I went to the club owner, and I said, I would like to audition for that job. And I took over that guy's gig when he wasn't there. And that was the first inkling that really inspired me to want to pursue the music. I had played so many bars and so many honky-tonks and bowling alleys, that was the training ground for me. I learned who I was as an artist. I learned how to not only perform, but I learned how to compete against all of these other distractions at a bar. And that was great, great training ground. And I still, to this day, pull from that book of knowledge that I got from playing all those clubs. That was the place where I learned very quickly who my audience was, what they would and would not accept from me as an artist. The greatest motivator for me was to have somebody tell me, you can't do something. Automatically made me think, oh really? Watch this. There were so many people that told me, you'll never make it before I broke into the music business and before I started having success because I was different. Everybody else was very clean cut. A lot of more cowboy hats I didn't. Meanwhile, I had hair down to about right here. I wore a lot of leather. I looked more like the audiences that I played for, which were biker bars. But the fact is, I was just as country as any of the other members of the class of 89, Garth Brooks, Alan Jackson, Clint Black. But I also wanted to bring in some of the other elements of music that I loved the rock elements. I was told no a lot. We can't play that song, it's too rock for country. And in other areas I was told, well you're too country for rock and roll. And after being told no so many times, when you finally do have success, there is a natural tendency to want to kind of thumb your nose a little bit at those people that said, no, you'll never make it. And basically look at them and say, how do you like me now? <laughs> Well, my mother always supported me. My father was very skeptical all along. Even after I quit my day job, he was basically in the background just kind of shaking his head going, son, when are you going to get a real job? He grew up around the Depression, and those musicians never amounted to much. The last thing in the world that I think he wanted for his son was to have me labeled as one of those people. It wasn't until 1991 that I was nominated for the Horizon Award at the Country Music CMA Awards, Best New Artist, basically. I invited my parents to come up, paid for them first class tickets, fly to Nashville. And I think that was the first time, I think my father pulled me off to the side and he said, son, I want you to know that the only reason that I tried to discourage you was because I knew how painful it would be if you weren't successful. But I was wrong. And he said, you've done extremely well. You've far succeeded all of my expectations and I want you to know that I'm very very proud of you and that was just a very touching moment for me as an artist but more importantly as a human being to get that validation from my father was very very special. My latest album is an album called A Homegrown which we recorded here in Georgia in front of a live audience that experience of being live on stage elevates me to a different level as a performer. It's a reminder of why we do this. And it's a great day. I'm
As a kid growing up, some of my earliest memories of music was listening to the Grand Old Opry. Even though that was being broadcast live from Nashville, and that's only about a four hour drive from Marietta, it seemed like it might as well have been on another planet, like it was a million miles away. My father used to tell me stories about growing up as a kid when he was a boy, listening to the Grand Old Opry. So, huge tradition that dated back as far as generations before me. So with all the pushback that I got for being kind of rock-edged country, I never thought that the Grand Old Opry would let me in. And it was very much a surprise when I got the invitation to play the Opry for the first time. I'll never forget it. Because you realize you're standing on a piece of wood, all these great people that I idolize stood at one time on that same piece of wood. And if that won't make your knees kind of quiver a little bit, I don't think anything else would. So I was very nervous. I was supposed to do two songs. And I did my two songs and the response was just phenomenal. And so Jack Green brought me out, not only for one encore, but for two encores. My first time on the Grand Ole Opry. And the reception could not have been warmer. And that's when I really felt like for the first time, that I was getting accepted into this country music community in Nashville. It was a great feeling. I think the thing about country music from my era that made it so relatable was we talked about things that everybody goes through. How we feel about our community, the people we grew up around, how we feel about our family, the acquisition of love or the loss of it, how we feel about our country. And I think all of those different elements are represented in just about every single country song that I can think of that I grew up listening to and that people from my generation tried to write about. We wrote about things that people actually experienced, that relatability from fans. People walk up to me and they'll say, man, when you wrote that song or when you sang that song, you must have been reading my mail. Those sentiments that were in that song were things that I've been trying to say to my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my husband or my wife. You put them into music and said everything I've been trying to say. That's when you know that you've connected. Those songs become more than just songs. They become the soundtrack to our lives. 